you referred to uh, Division Three football as uh, glorified intramurals, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, 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 you want to I throw me play. into the ocean? You, you yeah, quite literally threatened to pick me up, and throw me into the ocean, is what you threatened to do. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Always College Football. Today is Tuesday, September 13th. Hope you're enjoying the show wherever it is you're getting the show. Whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or if you're here with us on the ESPN YouTube channel, thank you so much for being here. Week two was phenomenal. Week three might be even better. It's just going to get better and better as the games continue to roll along. We're going to have a great show for you today. He's Mark Kubiak. I'm Greg McElroy, and we have an awesome game plan. We have the Kansas head coach, Lance Leipold, on the show little hint we're going to do the biggest surprise teams both for the good and for the bad so if there's any hint maybe kansas is on the surprise teams and i can promise you it's for the good that's for sure and we're going to hit your mailbag to answer all the questions you may have so without much further ado let's talk about it All right, we begin our series about the most surprising teams here in the first two weeks of the season by welcoming on the head coach of the Kansas Jayhawks. He's Lance Leipold. I would say I'm surprised, Coach, but I know you far too well. Uh, I must say, a 2-0 and start with you is the least thing, it's the least surprising thing I've seen maybe in the football season, man. Congratulations on a great start. Well, good to be with you, Greg. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, really proud of our guys, uh, especially this last week, going out to Morgantown and battling everything, taking it in overtime, finding a way to win. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a process here for about 16 months, but we're, we're starting to show signs of where we want to be. Well, it's amazing the fruits of the labor that are starting to come to the forefront, Coach. I know, you know, depth is a challenge, or at least it was. So you guys have started fast, but not often really finished all that well. Wasn't the case. On the road, hostile environment, good team. I think West Virginia is really good, by the way. And you guys got better as the game went along. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, again, I, I think that's being comfortable in what we were doing. I, I think we had some penalties early offensively that, that kind of put us behind the, the eight ball a little bit, had to punt. And and they're pretty explosive, like you said. They're you know JT Daniels is an experienced quarterback, very comfortable in that system with Graham Harrell, and you could see that. And, and uh, size and speed on the offensive side of the ball and an excellent – defense a front seven and and uh but uh, you know we we're able to show a few things that we hadn't that we didn't use first game and I think we found some rhythm our quarterback Jalen Daniels I thought really really played with a lot of confidence and uh you know I, I think kind of the other thing you're alluding to is we played well down the stretch last year and th- this group started to get a, a new sense of confidence in in themselves and I think w- within the within the walls of the program and how we're going to go about it. And and that showed itself Saturday night. Coach, you, of course, for those that are unaware, Wisconsin Whitewater, uh, you, you never lost. I think you were undefeated, it felt like, for like seven straight years or whatever it was. You go to Buffalo, you change the culture, you finish up there, you have an 11-win season. Amazing, amazing year a few years back. You now go to Kansas and a place that struggled to win, and yet here you are finding success. How is it that you are able to change the culture so quickly at places that have often been where wins have been tough to come by? Well, I, I think each one has had its unique, uh, you know, situation, and, and but we find it to be a fit for how we go about doing things and want to doing the small things and doing them on a daily basis and find a way to get better each day. I don't think it's anything overly magical. Um, I've been very fortunate to have a group of coaches and and staff that have been we've been together now for quite a while, and and we've we we find that gel and we believe in the same things and and uh, you know this was a program that gone through a lot of changes and when I when I sat down to meet with the players individually just uh structure discipline routine all those type of things and and leadership leadership within the program leadership uh from a coaching staff were things that they were just hoping to see on a on a consistent daily basis and they've really embraced what we've done and um we're excited about what we're doing and 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 to be here in lawrence well, it's amazing what you've done so far, Coach, and just how you've done it. I want to ask you specifically about Jalen Daniels. Um, it's it's kind of amazing, and I, I credit that I think all great coaches adapt their scheme to their personnel. And I look at just how you changed and kind of tweaked from a year-to-year basis 
at Buffalo. And now we're seeing it, how you've kind of, you still use some of the same things that you used at Buffalo, but it's very different now with how you were attacking at Kansas. How do you get that assessment of what your personnel is capable of and make sure that they're very comfortable when they take the field every Saturday? Well, um, that's a great question. I, I think it's always been within our offensive philosophy that we want to be able to, to be multiple enough to utilize the strength of our current situation. And Andy Kolnicki is our offensive coordinator. Andy and I have been together for about 10 years now, and uh, we've been uh, really well aligned in that that thought process, whether we've been – you know, you refer to our time at Buffalo, you know, in 2018, we led the league in passing. 2019, we led the league in rushing. And, and right. we, you know, everybody wants to strive for balance and talk about it. I think we've done a, a, as good a job as we possibly can to to uh, truly live that. And um, we utilize that with a lot of different personnel groupings, uh, mu- multiple formations and shifts, and try to find ways to, to you know, you know, play to our strengths, so to speak. But what it also does, Greg, I think is you're able to get a lot of guys on the field that way. You yeah. keep guys engaged. It helps morale. It builds depth. And, and when and when you struggle like we have here for, for over a decade, you need as much things that, that can kind of create that culture of competition internally each and every day as well. That, but also reward the guys that are doing a good job, get them on the field, get them touches. And, and we've been able to do that here these first two weeks. Yeah, it's amazing, the the participation chart. It, I've done Kansas games in the past. It was like, look, we got three guys. We're going to go with these three, and they're going to get everything. Not not with you guys. You guys really spread it around. It's 100% correct. You referenced it best time, best start in over a decade. First 2-0 and o start since 2000. 11 for the Kansas Jayhawks. Doesn't get any easier. Uh, Houston this week coming off a difficult overtime loss. They've now played two overtime games against UTSA and against the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Uh, when you look at Houston, what challenges will they present your team? Uh, size and speed. I mean, uh, very electric on the outside. You can, you can, you know, they're going to play their first home game. You mentioned two quality opponents in-state rivals, so to speak, of uh, a lot, you know, a lot of guys lining up in those games that probably played against each other, knew each other well. Um, Coach Hogerson is obviously an outstanding coach there. They've been talked about as, uh, you know, they, they were a, a top 25 team to start the season. Somebody talking about, you know, are they going to be this year Cincinnati? A lot of things there. So um, on paper, it's going to be a huge uh you know they're they're going to win that battle probably and match up and playmakers and and uh, it'll be a huge challenge for us to go down there but one that uh, I know this team is embracing and and ready to go on and and take on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, I I know that um, I know that you guys will play to the very end. That's for sure. It's it's never a doubt what kind of effort we're going to get when we watch one of your teams. I want to go back uh, just for a moment, and I, I you know I've been in the Lance Leipold fan club for years. I told you that. <laughs> Uh, I, you, you know that I've been carrying the, long, long. Life, 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 man. <laughs> I don't care if there's seven of us. I'm one of the seven. All right. I'm in the Lance Leipold fan club. That's for sure. I pay my dues. Uh, but I'll say this, our, our relationship did not get off to the strongest start. Um, tell the people how we uh, got introduced and, and where our relationship started. It was in a lovely place. I'll say it was in the Bahamas at yes. the Bahamas bowl. So let's start. From from the day that we met and and how that interaction started. <laughs> well, it's funny because as we we're ready to do this, I was meeting with my athletic director and I shared with him this story. So it it has come off my lips here in the last hour. But uh, <laughs> I used to listen to you quite a bit uh, on, on the on national radio and everything. And um, now we have a little difference on how the story came out, of course. But we <laughs> we we were sitting in the Bahamas, though, having a dinner with all, all the coaches, staffs, administrators, and, and media people doing the game, and it was a great setting and all that. But I had to slide in that there was a time I was listening, and uh, you referred to uh, Division Three football as uh, glorified intramurals. <laughs> and uh, I uh, – I, I, you I wanted to I throw me into the ocean. You you yeah, quite literally threatened to pick me up and throw me into the ocean is what she threatened to do. That's that. But what I was saying, it was what I was saying though, and you took it negatively, which I loved. 
Uh, that, that goes to show you what kind of chip on the shoulder that Lance Leipold has. First of all, he's a Hall of Famer. He's got six national championships at the D3 level uh, with, with, with Wisconsin Whitewater. But I was saying it that the, the, it was so poorly resourced that if you want to find out about coaches, like, hey, man, you, like, these are guys that love to play. Like, I mean, this is, there's no fame and fortune coming with Division Three football. It was, it was said not, it wasn't said glowingly by any stretch because anytime <laughs> you say the word intramurals, it can be taken negatively, but it was meant to give more credence to the love that you find at that level of football. So you interpreted it one way, I interpreted it another, but ever since then, we've been thick as thieves, man. And I couldn't tell you how excited I am for you and the success that you're having there in Lawrence. Well, thanks. Yeah, I kind of took it as you thought there's maybe a, a, a keg in the end zone if somebody <laughs> scored or something like that. But, but no, it was – and it kind of went back to – I had another media friend uh, in Nebraska that, that one time he, he, he watched our first national championship game, and he said to me, he goes, man, you guys look like really organized and everything. Like, you know, it was like, you know, maybe we were just drawing them up on the sideline and, you know, like – you go around the tree and run a curl route or something. But um, so, so that's kind of the thing. And, but when, you know, Greg, all seriousness, you know, when people talk about the difference of, of uh, you know, from FBS to division three, I always right. say, you know, I'm not finding whole sponsors and foursomes for the golf outing to play, pay the bill. And I think when you look at people like Matt Campbell and Jason Candle from Mount, you know, others that have worked their way through, um, there's a lot of good coaches and, and a lot of people. And that's why when I mentioned our staff continuity, a lot of those same people were with me at, at, at Whitewater that, that are with us now. And uh, I'm awful glad that they are. Well, there's no denying, Coach. You are self-made. And uh, I, I mean this. You know this. I tell you this. You're a friend. But I'm genuinely, genuinely happy for the success that your program's experiencing. And like I said, I'm not at all surprised. Uh, it's only a matter of time. When you become in charge, it's only a matter of time before things get going in the right direction. So best of luck. Congratulations. And we couldn't be more happy for you. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. And rock chalk. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. All right, great stuff from Coach Leipold. You can see why he's been successful at every single stop. No surprise at all that he's having success at Kansas currently. Let's see if they can keep things going when they go on the road to Houston this week. All right, they're not the only surprise team this year. There's been a handful of others. I'm going to give you a list. Kansas is one. Let's continue on. I got five major surprise teams for the positive, five major surprise teams for the negative, but I'm not going to beat a dead horse. Some of the negatives are just surprising because they're kind of doing it in a different way. We'll get to it here in just a minute. Let's get to the second surprise team. That would be the Syracuse Orange. A couple of things that are really surprising about this team. We know Sean Tucker's legit, all right? And I'm not going to just totally lose my mind about wins against both Louisville and against UConn. I'm not going to just go over the moon and say, well, look at, look at these wins. I mean, no, they're not. It's not the greatest competition ever, but how they're doing it, I think, is remarkably impressive. Sean Tucker, Tucker we knew he was fantastic. Ran for 112 yards this past week against UConn, but they really kind of sold out against Sean Tucker. He has just 212 rushing yards through two games. Not terrible, but maybe not up to the standard that we'd come accustomed to seeing from one of the best backs in the country. His longest run from scrimmage last week was 13 yards. So the fact that they're winning big and winning convincingly, even though their best player hasn't been at his best, is fantastic. Well, part of the reason why they've been so dang good is Garrett Schrader, a quarterback. He's been a revelation. And we thought, all right, one game against Louisville, really good performance. Well, he did it again against UConn. He was 20 of 23 for a career high 287 yards and two touchdowns. That's a pretty good spot. Counted for five touchdowns so far already in the first two games. He's been poised. He's been efficient. He's been accurate. And it hasn't been exclusive to just at the line of scrimmage. He's hit some intermediate throws. He's hit some throws downfield. I think Garrett Schrader's really taken a huge step. Did take a couple sacks, but I mean, if that's really what we're going to focus on, I mean, we are really nitpicking the performance so far 
from Schrader through two weeks. So the fact that they now have a capable running mate alongside Sean Tucker is a really exciting option. And they got some talent at wide receiver. And they had 10 different receivers catch passes last week against UConn. They had a pretty good performance the week before as well. And you had four catches, four receivers with three catches or more. So they're spreading the ball around, man. They have weapons on the perimeter. That's a very exciting thing for a Syracuse offense that has certainly experienced some hits or misses. And then defensively, look at their performance. Like I said, I don't want to just totally you know, give them the best defense of the year award. They're not the 85 Bears. But if you look at the performance against Louisville, pretty dang good. You look at the performance this past week, outside of two plays, they give up a 28-yard touchdown run. They give up a 56-yard receiving touchdown. Outside of those two plays, UConn managed about 118 yards total offense. All right? Pretty good. So the defense getting it done as well for the Orange. They're one of our surprise teams at 2-0. and How about the Duke Blue Devils? We're not going to spend a ton of time on Duke, but still take care of business week one against Temple. Not bad. All right, not bad at all. Think about this. Temple, one of the best defensive performances. Remember Mike Elko, his first year head coach of the Duke Blue Devils. Not sure where. Hey, I'm not sure he's going to be on coach of the year or anything, but think about this for a moment. And I'm not trying to make Temple out to be anything great either, okay? They're one of the worst teams in America. But either way, they were shut out. And Duke had not had a shutout since 1989. That's all I needed to know. And you look at how they performed the following week, kind of got a little bit more justification by going on the road and handling the Northwestern Wildcats. Really hot start, great in the first half. Didn't play quite as well in the second half, but either way, Duke is legitimate. Waters had a couple touchdowns. You look at what Riley Leonard's doing at quarterback. There's some things to like about what Duke's done. I'm not saying that they're going to win the ACC. I'm not saying they're going to get to the ACC championship or anything like that. Don't like, don't, you know, don't send it to freezing cold takes or anything. All I'm saying is Duke is serviceable. It's a pretty good step in the right direction. A great start at 2-0 and there for Duke and new head coach Mike Elko. Let's go next to a team that's kind of been a trendy team so far in college football. They are the benefit of the doubt there in week zero. They went out and they rolled in week zero. This is the fighting Illini of Illinois. The fighting Bielamas, if you will. You're going to say, well, they're 2-1. and one. They lost in the end. They're 0-1 of the Big Ten. I, fair. Fair. Not going to push back on any of that. And... They're kind of winning in spite of themselves right now, too. That's probably the most amazing thing. This team has eight turnovers in their last two games. Eight. That's right. You heard that right. Eight turnovers. It's tied for second most in all of college football. New Mexico State, right now, number one. They have nine turnovers. Illinois has eight. And they're both in the last two weeks. So they are winning in spite of themselves. We know Chase Brown's unbelievable. He is electric at running back. I think DeVito's been okay. At quarterback, done some good things, done some not so good things. But if you look at their game against Indiana, they had about six, seven different times that they could have put that game away. Of course, give up the drive late. Credit to Indiana. It's a great, resilient performance by pulling off the victory. But Illinois, I think, probably came away from that game saying, man, kind of kicking ourselves for the performance that we put forth right there. This team could easily be 3 0, easily, if not for the shortcomings of last Friday night's performance against Indiana. But either way, they've been a real positive. I wasn't sure what the growth would look like. I wasn't sure what Barry Lunny's offense would look like. They're now kind of running that pro-tempo type of offense. But man, they got playmakers. And defensively, I mean, defensively, this team is flat out getting after you. I mentioned the fact that they have eight turnovers. Well, they forced seven. All right, so they're forcing an awful lot. So it's not like they have this massive turnover differential problem. But man, they've they've done a lot of really good things here in these first few weeks. I think they got a lot of playmakers on defense, especially along the front. They got a lot of playmakers on offense, headlined by Chase Brown. So I think that they are another team that has surprised me for the better so far this year. I wouldn't be surprised if they made a little noise in the Big Ten, I might add. I'm not saying that they're going to win the division or anything, but they're going to be a tough out. And I wouldn't be shocked if they play spoiler at some point or another against a team that has legitimate expectations. And then finally... Team number five, one of the biggest upsets of this past weekend. How about the Washington State Cougars? The Washington State Cougars. Now, what I want to highlight, and they were fortunate this past week, all right? But still, 17.5 point dog victory. 17.5 point dog victory is a victory, man. Take it and run. All right, you're playing against the Wisconsin Badgers. You get out, gain 400 plus, 401 
to 253. You had the ball for just 22 minutes, and yet you find a way to get it done. How about this? Wisconsin was 78-0 since 2000. 78-0 since 2000 when they rushed for at least 400 and allow less than 300. 78-0 and 0 since 2000. Well, now they're 78 and 1. You're going to say, well, Greg, how can you be impressed with Washington State? Because they found a way to get a win. So many people are like, oh, you know, focus on the negatives. Well, if you find a way to win, you deserve a lot of credit. No matter what, a win is a win is a win. Whether you earned it or didn't earn it, a win is a win. You just said, well, you just said that Illinois should have won. Well, I get that. I understand that I'm kind of contradicting myself from one place to another, but Wisconsin is a very proud football team, ranked in the top 20 at home. And they couldn't get it done, all right, against a Washington State team that did a lot of really nice things. A couple of things that have really stood out to me. One, their special teams. Obviously, Renard Bell, he had that opening kick, kickoff return there in the second half to take it all the way to the Badgers' 27-yard line. They've been getting it done on special teams so far. Cam Ward, I think, is as advertised. Still some polish that needs to come into his game. Still some polish. But remember, this is a guy that's making the jump from incarnate word. He's now heading up to Division I, highest level of football, and has been pretty dang solid. He's got a good weapon in Nakia Watson. Like what they were able to do. Nakia Watson, by the way, in the open field off the flat, catch and run, made a guy miss to the house. Very impressive there. And then probably the biggest thing for Washington State was how they performed defensively. Think back to Washington State, you know, the Mike Leach era. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, some, they've been pretty stout on defense, played pretty dang well on defense. Of course, you know, Mike Leach era is going to mostly be headlined with, hey, we're doing an awful lot on on offense. Like, look at how many yards we're throwing for, all this other stuff. And people are going to remember the offense as well. They did some decent things down the stretch on the defense side of the football. And it's carried over now. It feels like there's you know, kind of a lot of decent play being had there for Washington State defensively. If you really look at it, I mean, they did a great job of making a concerted effort to bottle up Braylon Allen. And I know Allen ended up, by the end of the game, having pretty decent numbers offensively. But when you look at how often they forced Allen to change direction in the backfield, I mean, the first quarter, he had 10 yards on seven carries. And look, over time, you're going to get a little bit worn down. I mean, that Wisconsin offensive line, they're going to just punch you in the face. and They're just going to lean on you. It's going to get harder and harder and harder. You look at it, first quarter in general, they hung in there as well as anybody has in quite some time. I mean, Wisconsin ran 14 times for 41 yards, and that includes a scramble by Graham Mertz. So Washington State, with how they're playing defensively, has been one of the nice surprises so far of the early season. So those were five teams coming into this year. Kansas, I referenced, Illinois, Duke, Syracuse, and Washington State. Five teams that were probably way under the radar. People did not have high hopes for them. And yet here they are, either at 2-1 and one or 2-0, and oh, with a lot of things to like with what we've seen in the first few weeks of the season. All right, now moving over to some of the season's surprising disappointments. Now, I'm not going to just kick you while you're down. It's not what the show's about. But there have been some surprising developments for a lot of teams that had high expectations coming into the season that just haven't really materialized, okay? Like I said, I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. I just want to address the areas that are supposed to be strong that haven't been strong and other areas that maybe have been strong we didn't expect them to be. All right, so let's start with Notre Dame. We all know that they're 0-2. We get that. Everyone's talking about, oh, Marcus Freeman's 0-3. Also, you know, offense can't score. I get it. But maybe the most, probably the biggest disappointment that I've experienced when watching Notre Dame so far this year is that their play along the line of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively, has left an awful lot to be desired. Think about Notre Dame over the last five or six years, okay? Have they had crazy elite wide receivers? No. Have they had crazy elite, you know, edge rushers? Have, no. Have they had crazy elite, you know, skill players? No, not particularly. They haven't. But what they have had is unbelievable offensive line play for the most part, and they've been really stout in the middle of their defense. Not the case this year. 
so much. Everyone's beating up Tommy Reese and Tyler Buckner and all these other guys. Understandable. I'm not saying that they show, don't deserve their fair share of criticism. They do. But when I think Notre Dame, I think they're going to be stout against the run and you're going to earn your yards. That hasn't been the case so far. They need to get that address. So that's probably been the first sign of disappointment for me with Notre Dame is why can't they stop the run? That's their bread and butter. That's where they need to live. Why can't they run the football? That's their bread and butter. That's where they need to live. I want to see them commit to both here in the future, and hopefully they'll get a little bit better as the season moves along. That's the first disappointment. Second disappointment, the Boston College Eagles. I'm not picking on Catholic schools, right? Notre Dame, Boston College, I'm not picking on you. All right, but Boston College just gave up five sacks and 10 tackles for a loss and finished with just four rushing yards. You heard that right. Boston College, five sacks, 10 tackles for a loss, and finished with just four rushing yards against Virginia Tech. All right? Not what you're wanting at all. Phil Jerkovic threw an interception on the second play of the game, and after that interception, they had six consecutive three and outs with minus six yards on their first seven drives. Hear me out for a second. All right, hear me out. Minus six yards on their first seven drives. That's alarming. You have a veteran quarterback. You have talented core of wide receivers. You have decent running back. And yet the strength of your team last year was your offensive line. Now, I don't think anyone expected it to continue to be a strength. You had some departures along the front. But man, that's got to get cleaned up. That's where you're going to live. You got to be better offensively. You look at everything and look credit to Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech got aggressive. They played much better throughout the course of this game. They didn't have the same mistakes that they had the week before. Didn't have turnovers the way they had the week before. So they cleaned it up and it was a job well done. But Boston College, man, got to get things ironed out. The perimeter skill and the talent on that offense, way too good to have starts like that. So hopefully they can get things ironed out and they can start taking steps forward. Let's get to surprising and disappointing team number three. One of my favorite teams in the preseason coming into 2022 were the Army Black Knights. They begin 0-2 for the first time since 2015. Got to give credit to UT San Antonio. You also have to give credit to Coastal Carolina. It's not like they've played, you know, little sisters of the poor. Here are the first two weeks of the season. Obviously, they haven't. They've played quality competition, and UTSA got in a great rhythm there in the second half of that football game offensively, and Army just couldn't keep up. Defensively, their lack of depth has kind of gotten exposed. And their lack of depth, if you're Army, should never get exposed because games shouldn't be long enough, and the opposing offense shouldn't have enough snaps to allow your lack of depth to get exposed. Here was what I think is the most surprising stat I think I've seen watching the game back. I was shocked at how much they leaned on the pass. They threw for 304 yards. That was the most passing yards by an Army offense since 2007. All right. Marshall and Robinson combined for seven catches and 163 yards and a couple touchdowns. When was the last time you heard a stat line like that for the Army Black Knights? So maybe not quite. And look, the UTSA sold out against stopping the fullback. Now Army still got their yards because that's just what they do, but they averaged I think like three and a, three and change uh, per carry, which is just not what we've become accustomed to with the Army Black Knights. So hey, credit UTSA, but Army's got to get things turned around. Lost a couple close games now, a couple close games against quality competition. I think they will get things turned around. I'm very optimistic that they will get things turned around. But those that were saying, hey, Army's got an outside shot to potentially get to the New Year's Six, it feels like those hopes have been dashed at least at the moment. I still think they're going to be pretty good. Not pressing the panic button there if I'm Army. Let's move to disappointment number four, West Virginia. I think what's most surprising about West Virginia and where they're at right now, not that they're not winning games because you could have made a pretty clear argument. They could have easily won both the games that they've played. All right. We're cruising in the first half of that football game against Kansas this past week. Couldn't get anything going offensively there in the second half. Well, technically couldn't get anything going for the most part, offensively there in the second half. And the other thing, too, against Pitt, man, they had the ball in their racket, just couldn't finish. Had the pick six late. Obviously, that led to the loss. This team's close. But I think what's most 
surprising to me, the biggest revelation to me with West Virginia is the fact that for a long time, a long time, at least feels like the last two or three years, the defense has ruled the day. I mean, the, the defense has really kind of been how they won games, kept teams low scoring, kind of limited possessions, forced a lot of three and outs. And for the most part, West Virginia's offense, I'm not saying they've sputtered, but they haven't been a real consistent group. Well, now that's completely flipped. I mean, if you think about the fact that they punted just one time and scored 42 points, it's hard to blame the offense. I mean, yeah, they weren't perfect, but you score 42 points, you should feel pretty good about being able to secure the victory. Now they missed Charles Wolfs. I get all that, but man, I mean, his impact shouldn't be felt that much. JT Daniels has been excellent. I feel like for the most part through for 360 through three touchdowns clearly is an upgrade that they've had at the position. And Bryce Ford Wheaton's a superstar. Another stellar day this past weekend He's one of the best wide receivers in all of college football, four touchdowns, two point conversion. The guy continues to do an awful lot for this offense. So I think that's probably one of the biz- biggest shocking things for West Virginia so far is that the offense is as our advertised, but the defense is certainly not what we thought it might be because man, they've been good the last couple of years just hasn't been the case here through the first two games. And then finally, Another huge surprise. Much like what we just talked about with West Virginia, let's go just a little bit to the East and talk about Virginia. All right, we know that Virginia last year, they were terrible on defense, right? Awful. Well, they were great on offense, though. And what the heck has happened there? I mean, now you're looking at it. They can't run the football. They had 29 carries for 42 yards. If you're doing the math, I did, not off the top of my head, but that's about 1.4 a carry. All right, that's not going to be good enough. Uh, they have arguably top three, top four quarterback in the ACC and an excellent, diverse receiving core. Some guys with great length, some guys with great speed and an offensive minded head coach that has scored a lot of points in his tenure in Tony Elliott. Now he's t- coming over from Clemson. Maybe there's a little bit uh, of a different way of how they're kind of going about doing things, but still, I mean, this is an offense that I thought was going to be in some ways unstoppable this year. Well, they scored three points, three points this past weekend. I don't, I don't know if it's Tony Elliott or does Kitchings, but you see Armstrong. I mean, he goes 13. And like I said, one of the best quarterbacks in the ACC, 13 to 32 for 180. I mean, they got to find some completions for this guy. And I think one of the most biggest surprising things is that their defense has come to play this year. I mean, they forced four turnovers last week. I mean, the defense was extremely disruptive, I thought, at times, especially after they weathered the storm of the first half. So much like West Virginia, except completely opposite. Now the defense is playing great. What the heck happened to the offense? At West Virginia, the offense is playing great. What the heck happened to the defense? So some surprising revelations. Like I said, all those five teams, I just listened, Notre Dame, Virginia, West Virginia, Army, and Boston College. They can get things flipped. It's early, but man, you better get it flipped in a hurry. All right, let's move it along to our mailbag. Coobs, let's kick it off. All right, first mailbag question comes from Jim in Tuscaloosa. Do Alabama fans need to worry about the lack of discipline that came out against Texas? And is it concerning that they will not get tested in their next two weeks before going to Arkansas? Well, first of all, um, you do play an SEC opponent in two weeks. Uh, I'll start with that. I know Vanderbilt uh, came back down to earth this past week, but they are still an SEC opponent. So it's a conference game. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, at least it's quarterback run centric too, because Mike Wright, uh, he can create on his own. And KJ Jefferson at Arkansas, of course, can create on his own as well. So you'll at least have some plan that is carry over from one game to the next. Uh, moving on, though, Alabama's got a lot of things to iron out. A win's a win. You take it and run. Feel good about it. It's hard to win. All right. There's a lot of teams that would love to be in your shoes and have a really gutsy performance only to get the victory. Texas A&M, Notre Dame, a handful of others came up short in playing their C-plus game, C-minus game in some cases, and they lose. Alabama played their C game, still won. Got to feel good about it. 
Uh, I would be most concerned right now about these three areas of the Crimson Tide. One, I'd be very concerned about the wide receiver position. Not because they don't have talent at that spot, but it's because it's not the same level of talent that it feels like they've had in quite some time. All right. That when you're comparing Alabama, this Alabama team to the few, the past Alabama teams, you got to compare it to the past Alabama teams that were great. They went on to win championships. How does this receiver room stack up to recent years? They don't. The other position of concern is at corner. By the way, I'm pretty sure if you listen to the Alabama breakdown that we did a couple weeks ago, I told you that these were positions that you need to be concerned about. Corner is a major problem. Everyone's telling me how great Eli Ricks was in the preseason. Well, he's not that great. He's very, very inconsistent, and he's been a little bit banged up. You also have Kyrie Jackson, who's been inconsistent as well. Kool-Aid McKinstry's young. He's going to have some growing pains, but he's very, very talented. He's just young. And then Terry on Arnold, who got put in there late in the game, maybe he gets a little bit more playing time. Maybe he becomes the guy, but they got to be better at that position. And biggest thing that I'd be concerned about right now, after what I saw this past week, is that blueprint, that game plan will be repeated. So the things that gave you fits in the open field against Texas, from your defense's perspective, will get repeated again. The things that gave you fits offensively, that will get repeated. Arkansas will repeat it, I would imagine. a and will repeat it, I would imagine. Uh, LSU will repeat it, I would imagine. Mississippi State won't because they're not going to change their stripes. LSU or Ole Miss will repeat that performance. Everybody's going to be watching that tape from last weekend, and it was a substandard performance based on what we've seen from Alabama in the past. So... Take it. It's a win, but now you really got to address a lot of the issues. Penalties will get cleaned up. I'm not concerned about that, but there's a lot of other things that need to get cleaned up as well, and those are not as easy to fix. All right, Kevin in Arizona. Impressive win by BYU on Saturday night. With their schedule, could BYU actually crash the CFP? Well, let's take a look at their schedule first and foremost. BYU is unbelievable, the schedule that they're able to put together every single week. I, I don't know how they get all these teams to play them, but if you think BYU can go 11-1 and one with this schedule, a lot of people would say, well, they're, you know, they need to be undefeated to get into the college football playoff. I, I don't know if I agree with that. Tell me whose schedule is more difficult. Clemson? Or BYU. Now, BYU just took care of a top 10 Baylor. All right. They still have a top 25 Oregon on the schedule. Notre Dame will come to them. They have a top 10 Arkansas on the schedule. Liberty currently is undefeated. BYU heads to them. East Carolina, we saw what they did to NC State earlier in the season. East Carolina plays BYU. Stanford. Maybe a pretty decent offense. Questions on defense. Boise State's a proud program. I mean, I think you could even make a case that, yes, not only can they flirt with a college football playoff berth, because right now the Pac-12, very much open for debate. ACC, we'll see how it all unfolds. Big 12 could easily cannibalize itself. So I think they actually are in pretty good position to potentially make a run. And I even think, too, unlike other teams that have been in this position before out of the, quote, group of five, I think they could lose a game and still get back in good favor because of the strength of the schedule that they will compile. All BYU needs to do now is root for Baylor, root for Notre Dame, root for Oregon, root for Stanford, root for the teams that's on your schedule because you want them to be as good as humanly possible to boost your resume. And if you're 11-1 to with wins over all these teams, you lose maybe a heartbreak close one, say, on the road or against Arkansas, it wouldn't shock me if you find yourself in a position to make that argument. All right. And last one, George in Michigan. I know the opponents have not been great, but Michigan looks really good early in the season. Besides Ohio State, do you see anyone that can challenge them in the Big Ten? Yes. I mean, I, I think Michigan looks excellent. Albeit, you know, I think that Hawaii and Colorado State, Colorado State's been awful. Uh, Hawaii's 0-3. I mean, their teams they've played it against are a combined 0-5, all right? So, uh, but I'm not going to focus quite as much on who they played. I'm going to focus more on their own individual execution. We don't know anything about Michigan right now, and guess what? We're not going to learn anything this week either against UConn. We're not. They should win that game and win that game comfortably. 
But either way, you look at what they've done so far, job well done, man. You can't control who's on the schedule. All you can control is how you play within that schedule. I mean, Michigan's in a really good spot, but I also think, obviously, Michigan State has looked pretty dang good. I think Maryland has at times revved their engines and looked okay in the first couple of weeks of the season. Others that are on this schedule for Michigan too, I don't think Iowa's going to be the problem that I thought they might be, but I do think Illinois has a chance to make a little noise. That's in the week leading up to the road trip to Ohio State. You want to play Illinois in the second to last week of the season? Because based on what I've seen through three games from Illinois, I don't want to play them. Even though it's in Ann Arbor, I don't want to play Illinois, not the week before the biggest game of the year. So I think that's a dangerous team as well. So I think the Big Ten's actually a little deeper than I originally thought. And it's a real testament to the coaches and the staffs that have been put together. I think Minnesota's legit. Uh, I think Illinois is very, very good. I think Purdue is pretty good. I think Penn State's been a little bit better than I anticipated, at least early on, at least for this, you know, up to this point. We'll see if they can con- continue that. Uh, this week, when they go on the road to Auburn, that's when we're really going to learn, I believe, about Penn State and about Auburn, for that matter. Michigan State's the real deal. They've reloaded. Not surprised that they're having success. And then Michigan's reloaded. They're having success. So uh, I think the Big Ten's very, very deep uh, and should feel good about the stockpiled talent that a lot of these teams and programs have kind of put together. All right, now to some injury news and notes. Unfortunate news for the Fighting Irish quarterback, Tyler Buckner. Didn't look good when he went down on that shoulder, but he's now set to have shoulder surgery. Had a severe sprain to that shoulder. He's going to be out for four months, so that should end his 2022 campaign. Hate that for him, but Drew Pine will now step in as the full-time starter. And then bad news out of South Carolina. Mohamed Kaba and defensive end Jordan Strawn Both suffered ACL injuries, which will sideline them for the remainder of the year. So difficult news there out of South Carolina and out of South Bend after what was, gosh, it felt like a ton of injuries this week, especially to quarterback shoulders. I mean, Keaton Slovis got one. uh, Tyler Buckner had one. Quinn Ewers had one. It felt like a bunch of guys had shoulders this past weekend. So hate to see that. Fingers crossed they can make a full recovery. Some we'll see back on the field this year. Some we will see on the field in 2023. Look, we appreciate you being with us. It's been great discussing college football with you. Some of the surprising teams, of course, tomorrow we'll go into the 10 questions that we have for this weekend's games, this weekend's matchups. So we look forward to that. Please like, rate, and subscribe. It helps us out. It helps the show out. Tell your friends too. Word of mouth is massive for us here at Always College Football. So please let everyone know that we're talking about college ball every day. So we appreciate all the many things that you've been telling your friends about because the numbers are growing and growing and we really, really appreciate the interaction that we've had so far this year. For Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. For all of us here at Always College Football, we hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.